Are people tuned in yet? Here we are. <laughs> oh. oh. Yakini, Yakini. Yakini, Yakini, my brother. So coming on to this, just before we're coming on, when I see you, every time I see you, I gotta share how just my heart just explodes and I go into joy. Every time we meet, we go into the depths of the mysteries of mm. life and death beyond it, the farce of it. Mm. And we dive into, you know, the ancient wisdoms, which you have taken me right to the front door of. Mm. And my brother, elder brother here, beloved brother, Stephen Mailer, he's a, a Egyptologist extraordinaire. He has researched all the different schools of Egyptology, but, and he'll share his history. Mm. And he's a, scholar in many realms, many realms, his, history, science, feminism, uh, spirituality, consciousness, uh, just to name just even a little bit of his knowledge and background. He's an amazing man. And you were the one who took me to Egypt and took my group and, and, and showed us the ancient mysteries of Egypt that you can't read or find anywhere. And you took us what I believe twice. to be really, you know, twice. 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 But the first time, most important, because you were the last group that I had in Egypt to be with the master, Papa Hakim. And so and, as you feel, it's the same I feel, because of all the hundreds of people that I've brought to Egypt, you got it the most, because you connected with him. And I'd like to even open with a story that I'd like to tell about you, and I've told it before. When you came the first time with a group of 33 amazing people, and I hope some of them are even looking in tonight as they are. Namaste. When we came only six days because you were doing a tour of Africa with these wonderful people. So we came back from the south from the six wonderful days in the south. As we came from the airport riding the bus to go to the Mena House to check in to our hotel where we passed the village, Nazlet es Samam, the village of Papa Hakim. You wanted to get out the bus right then. You didn't want to go. We needed to check into our rooms and check it. I said, wait a minute, we got to do this first. No, no, no. You said, you know, because you valued every second that you spent. And that's why I feel so blessed that with you, you had uh, um, Sean and uh, Carolyn to video the conversations that you had, because that was some of his last testament, some of his last that he talked in public that he was actually recorded. And so that's what made it amazing. And even when I left Egypt, you came back again, of course, from Africa and spent those last couple of days. So it is value to me because he comes through me <laughs> when you're around. <laughs> Stephen, please, you know, <clears throat> there's so much to share here and there's, we're, we're going to do more of these mm. because, you know, one of these with you is not enough. Mm. But, I'd like you to share, you know, who this man that you've just shared about is, Papa Hakim. Well, because it's someone very close to us and how he came to you and how that you brought me to him. Well, that's actually a long story that was, you know, attempted to be videoed, has not happened. And, and uh, this last tour that I did was supposed to have been totally dedicated to him and his teachings. And it didn't happen the way I wanted. That's why I say it's the last public tour I'm going to do. But I just want to share also because what this moment is about. Before we were going to do this talk, two quotes came to me. Mm. The, ancient the ancient Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. Mm. But also came to me the great Charles Dickens. These are the best of times. These are the worst of times. So the major thing that this man taught us is about cycles. And that's why it's important we will get into that today because of what's going around us. Uh, it would take hours to tell the whole story. I mean, because this was an amazing man and it's a man that uh, uh, it's now 12 years going on that he left us, 12 years that you actually came to see him. He passed and left this plane that we say Weston in August 23rd, 2008. But he did this interesting thing with me that I've read about only about other people that have experienced great masters in their lives that what a great master can do for you. As the great Rajneesh would say, who we were both into, a master does nothing for you. 
but what a master does is undo you and redo you. <laughs> and the classic example of that, of course, is this, the stories of Carlos Castaneda with Don Juan. Now, whether people want to believe in his stories going around that he made the whole story up, whatever. The value is the teachings that came out, not whether the story was real or not. But what Don Juan had to do with him, because he was so westernized, is he had to use the plant teachers, extreme measures to, to get him to come out of himself, which was peyote, which was the, the uh, St. John's Ward. He used a lot of different, of course, with uh, uh, cannabis too. And so, uh, and I've done that path and you've done that path. And that was part of Hakim's path too, because hashish was very important to him in his, 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 his way of life and how he taught. Never would force it on anybody. As you know, his house was the only house in Egypt where women could sit with men and smoke shisha. Not so in the rest of Egypt, very patriarchal Muslim culture. Women, if they smoke, they smoke secretly away, not in public. Only the men, not in Hakim's house. He offered it to anybody who would come in. Now people say, oh no, I don't do that. It's no smoke. Oh no, Ashish, oh no, I won't touch it. He, he would gently try. Okay, you know, he tried again. Just take one hit, one try. No, 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 okay? That would, that would dedicate, that would dictate the level of the conversation. As you know, because you stayed up with me hours and hours, hours, hours. hours and hours and hours. He would keep making bowl after bowl after bowl <laughs> until you could say, Papa, no more. Alas, I can't do anymore. I'll fall asleep. I'm going to throw up, whatever. I mean, but you know, because the more you smoke, the deeper went the conversation. And yes. that's, that's how he is with me now. He rides the smoke. So what I'm wearing, of course, is very important. You've never seen me wear this before. So I'm going to show you a picture that's right behind me. And we'll get it up on camera. Okay. Last, ah, yes. last, last full tour, March of 2007, where my beloved uh, uh, Teresa was with me, and so was Patricia. His last full tour, wearing this wonderful Galavea. So at the end of this last tour, I did September 2018, beloved sister Rabba comes to, to have lunch with us with a wonderful gift in a paper bag of this Galilea. Oh, beautiful. So, beautiful. And I wear it every night, just not tonight, you know. So he comes through and what he would say, I mean, this man was, it's an unusual story because he started his life under the auspices of being in a Muslim environment under patriarchy. There's a couple of very significant events that we can mention when he was six years old now, he, he was very close with his mother and his mother's family. And, and he had a beloved uncle who we'd always talk about, Zehi Mahmoud Awiyah, his mother's brother. Now, whether his, Zehi had sons of his own who died young or whatever, he at a young age adopted Hakim to be like a son and took very special guidance on him. So, one of the first major influences, yes, he always would speak of his beloved uncle. What did his uncle do? At six years old, sent him to study with a Sufi master. Now, ostensibly, to learn to memorize the Quran. Now, that was not unusual. At this time, we're talking about the late 20s, 30s, the early 30s. Yes. It was very, most boys were sent to memorize Quran, but very few actually did. He did. Numerous times I would see arguments in the house with his beloved friend who's passed on, may he rest in peace, Sayed the bricklayer, who would always bring me the best herb that there was in Egypt at the time, <laughs> and, the best, and the best hashish for, for Papa. They would argue about a, a phrase in Quran, and Papa would say, no, it's Zaza -za. No, there'd be other people there. He'd say, no, it's Zaza -za He would say, Mariam, calling his daughter. She'd come out of the door, bring the Quran, bring the Quran, open it up. Every time he was right, punctuation, letter point, everything, accent, yes. whatever. He memorized the Quran. He was a master of what, nine languages? Not at, least, just... at least seven, yes, at least seven. But a master of ancient commission, which yes. is the hieroglyph, which very few people really know today. Yes. Very few. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, he memorized the Quran, but he would always say, and of course, he learned Sufi wisdom. 
he would always say to me over and over again, the most important thing, and, and let me tell you his teacher's name first. An Egyptian name, Ismail, and I met his great-great-grandson sitting in Hakim's house one day smoking shisha with us. His great-great-grandson, same name, Ismail. But he was given the title Zen Nar. Mm. Nar in Arabic is fire. But Zen is not an Arabic word, as you know. What is the origin of the word Zen? Nobody really knows. Is it ancient Chinese? Is it ancient Korean? Nobody really knows. But it means meditation. Zen Buddhism is just always being in meditation. Zen, Chan, Dian. Now you see the language connections, right? So Zen Nar, the fire of meditation. Hakim would say, ah, the most important thing my master ever taught me was to meditate. Isn't that the basis of every teaching we go through, right? He was a very, to me, he was a, a like an enlightened grandfather. Yes. In the short time I knew him, yes. it wasn't short at all. It yes. was like an eternal bond of remembering. Yes. And he would have, he, you know, it's like you say, Zenar was his teacher's name, spiritual yes. teacher. And in a way, I experienced it as a, like an African Zen. Oh, death. An ancient Did African, timeless... Yes. Very African. The tradition was very African. He was what could be called, an anthropologist would call him an Afrocentrist. Yes. That he thinks it all began in Africa. Now, he even said the white race originated in Africa. Red race, yellow race, brown race, black race, all originated in Africa. Well, now He's, the migration patterns of humanity has been discovered through all genetic well that is a big but there's a big argument australia wants to claim that they were first and they came to africa that is people want to claim that asia was first and asia came to africa and brought everything hakim would say we fed each other he would talk about a time when there was just one continent pangaea pangaea and africa was at the center the ib and he said the ib of africa was kemet so that's where kemet comes from so the heart, heart, heart. But he would say, listen, he would say, Asia gave Africa rice. Africa gave Asia wheat. So the, the chain exchange is so far back. Who's to say who was first, this and that? He was an Afrocentrist. To him, it was Africa, where you were born. Yes. <laughs> ah, Africa. Bless Africa. Africa. Mama Africa. Mama. That's why that's why it becomes Africa. the matriarchy comes from Africa. And that's why the matriarchy runs through Kemet. That was one of the most important streams of teaching that the Egyptology doesn't see. That's why we say Kemetology, not Egyptology. And I was the one to put the title on it. He had the teaching. I saw as very quickly upon meeting him in 1992, you know, uh uh I'm intending to return, and I want to put that in your head. In yes. 2022, when it will be safe. Okay. It will be a 30-year anniversary for me of meeting him. Uh, I'm putting that out there for everybody to know. It's going to be a private group. I'm tired of having people come who really don't belong. <laughs> and that's enough of that. Negativity is all around us. That's why it's so important now to maintain that positive space. And it's very interesting, since that incident of the last tour I did, I've gone into preparation for what's going on now. My wife and I both have become hermits and sort of gone into recluse. Opposite of you and your wife, we have no more lectures, no more public tours, no more uh, uh, gatherings, no more concerts, not even going out to movies and restaurants for a long time now. So when this came, there's nothing new to me what's going on right now. I'm, I'm, you know, we're doing what we normally do. Just go out for groceries and that's it. And so, uh, but I it is the cycle. Around. He Was would talk about the cycle. cycles. That's the right. Cycles. Okay. What people don't see, what I really want it to be the theme of this tour that we did, did, which will be in 2022, is Hakim taught us to see the big picture. Yes. As the ancients did. Through his, his travels, his life, we can go into detail another time about his full life. But this was a master of many different traditions and wisdoms. But 
see, I called them Abu Zaid, the father of meditation, which yeah. they, they could, they, the, the guides used as a curse word. We used to go out to the tours and say, oh, no, you're with, you're, you're with, you're with Hakim, you're with Hakim. He's no good. He can't, he's the father of meditation. We don't want him at the site. Right. But everybody loved the meditations. We did incredible meditations. He started that in the 80s doing meditations at the site. So that shows it in his house. We, he's had all luminaries, like Every, the, oh. like like the doors. All types of people hang out in his. Do you want home. me to tell? Do you want me to tell the Jerry Garcia story? We could Jerry tell Garcia. Fast. <laughs> I went to Egypt in 1992. I hooked up with a woman who was. Anyway, just so you know, we're all in love. We're sharing about him because he's he he was directly responsible for a very core part of my awakening. Right on, and, my, and mine too. My nation in a whole new state of. A reality. Well, that's important to understand where we are now. Yeah. He said we're going to the awakening. He called yes. it, but he also said it would be darkest before the dawn. He yeah. warned me many times that bringing out the books that I had written, the tours that we were doing, that we would be attacked because the forces of darkness, how they are. We're in this age of Amun. Last 5,000 years, what it means is they're hidden. It means separation, polarity, labels, fucking labels, you, us, them, us, them, us, them. Well, Hakim taught the sesh, us, yes. just we, we the people. That's what the constitution first starts with, we the people. And that's what the ancients taught, and that's what he taught. He taught us to look outside yourself, to understand that what people were calling gods and goddesses are not gods and goddesses. The netters are principles of creation. But their senses that we have, 360 making circular consciousness, which we call enlightenment. To walk, you see it on the walls of the temples in the, even dynastic times when they were just putting propaganda on the walls, which the priests were keeping it to themselves. This is the age now we're in. Amen. Keep it hidden. Separate us and them. The top 1%, the rest of the 99%. Blah, 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 Jew, Christian, white, black, all of these fucking labels. And the labels that Hakim wanted to eliminate. He said, because so this, all they do is divide and exactly. separate. Exactly. So here's, you know, on this point of 360 degrees, mm. senses, the total senses that are capable in consciousness. That was his sort of spectrum model in a way. And then mm. I asked him, how, how do you even access these? Like, like, how do you get through them? And how did we lose them, right? And you know what he said to me? He says... When we're a baby, and he had this deep, resonant, loving, uh, like a deep, uh, loving grandfather speaking right to the soul, right? Like every moment, pure, like joy, humor, freedom, like unbelievable, right? And he would speak with laughter. And he would say that as babies, when we're, they're growing and they're maturing, we start labeling the senses. We say, oh, this is smell. The baby, you know, you know, sweetie, this is your eyes. This is your seeing. Now you're listening. Now you're tasting. And the, the labeling of the senses shrinks the perception field. And then consciousness, if you will, narrows to those identifications. And so he said the solution, in a way, was start, we're only perceiving those senses simultaneously in one gestalt, in one experience. They're not we separate. only have the language of the senses, he would say. There we go. He would talk and say, someone said to you, say to him, I saw a dream last night. No, you didn't. Your eyes were closed. You were asleep. Another sense was involved, but you only have the language of the five. In the 70s, there was a great black expression that we used to like to use. Uh, uh, I hear you, man. I hear you. But it's not with the ears. It's I hear, I understand what you're saying. There was a great novel by Robert A. Heinlein, Stranger in a Strange Land, where he used the term grok, G-R-O-K. People can Google it, grokking. It didn't mean anything we know in English except what they did in Avatar. I see you. I see you. That's what you did. Hakim saw you. You saw him. Very few people got that far. That's why those last conversations were so profound. He was, opening, he was opening up to you like, yeah, man, you can go to the PhD level. We don't have to start with 101. Right. So he shared to let go of labels. That's it. Practice that, which is the ultimate Zen practice. It, right? This is why he stopped the third book with me. You see, we yes. started. He came to me in Colorado in 2006, the three magnificent weeks of my life, lived here with us. We did this day and night, smoking, talking, smoking, talking. 
and we worked on Stockton. We were going to work on the hieroglyphic dictionary as per Abdel Hakim. <laughs> he said, yeah. okay, nobody could do 360. Was, another thing everyone should know that he was an indigenous wisdom keeper. The oral he was tradition. Also very, you know, he was a scholar in, in, in all the forms of Egyptology from a youngster. He was roaming through what we call the ruins or these ancient artifacts. With the, and meeting the, uh, the keepers, the people he would say, the, the old men at the sites. And they would show him things that Egyptologists never see, that of course tourists never see. And, and because, he of him, because of him and you, you've taken me into mysteries that secrets here come through here like you are the real life indiana jones in the sense <laughs> you even consult for the movies like and you work with crystal skulls it's like pretty amazing you know well, it was a blessing that he took me under because he saw that i had the background that he wanted i had the academic background i already had a master's in egyptology i had the background in medicine and other backgrounds but the background as and, a mystic you know, as a mysticism Yes, but the other thing, the other thing that we haven't mentioned that is very, you know, like it, it's of this time as well. You have, you're a scholar in feminism. You're one of the early ones. Well, that's, that's the point. He wife. recognized the system as a matriarchy. Yes. I'm, I'm, this is what happened with his uncle. His uncle took him over, brought him to the Zen master, okay? And then when he was eight years old, here comes an American archaeological expedition coming from Harvard University, led by Dr. George Reisner. And they're digging around the Sphinx. And they need the boys from the village to come clear the rubble and move the rocks. So Zeki sees an interest in Hakim, says, go, I'm going to set up a job. You work for him. OK. He does some stuff. He stumbles in one of the tombs of the old kingdom, eight years old. He looks up. He looks at the reliefs. And he says, I have to know what's written on the walls. I have to, at eight years old. And he left his life at that for the rest of his life, passed at 82. When he did, he knew what was written on those walls better than anybody that's ever lived, I think, since the old times. Yes. Because the decision was passed to him, and he understood what the glyphs mean. This is what I'm saying. We started on a third book. The book was going to be, he said, okay, nobody knows 360. Why it's 360? You have 180 we label masculine, 180 we label feminine. Every, every letter has a complement, okay? They saw things in complementary. When they devised the system, but I'll talk about when the system first started, there was none of this. But he would say, nobody knows 360. He said, but probably I could name 20 or 22. I said, Papa, that's enough for a book. Let's go. We started. And I'll tell you the thing. Well, I'm only going to tell you the first one. But then we got to seven. And he said, no, Steve. We're just doing what the Greeks did. Mm. We're, lab we're labeling them. I said, but Papa, he said, they will label themselves. That's what the awakening is all about. The war we become conscious. The war will recognize we have more than five senses. And they will label themselves. And he said that the labels were the traps and they're the biggest traps of this time of our consciousness. I got two more out of them, though. I got nine, but that was it. That was it. And, okay, and he, let me start with the first one because it comes back to his name, Zenar, right? Yes. The master's name. The first one. And my wife, Teresa, spotted it before me, why he started this way. The first one he started was two hooks. Now, one hook to the Egyptologists and the so-called alphabetic version of it, which is the Greeks did, not the Comitians, is S or Z. S or Z in the alphabet. No, it's two hooks. And Hakim said pronounced Zim. And Zim he said meant consciousness. Mm. That is the Comitian equivalent of the beginning, the end, the alpha, omega, and God, consciousness. So, Zim becomes Zen. Meditation leads to consciousness. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> you know? So, he stopped the project, my brother. Here he was working for a third, but he said, no, man, it's all. I, and I had to. Uh, I had on, to on this, ricocheting off this, brother, what happened is we're at, we're inside his place. We're sitting around, the hookah's going around and around. We have our group. We've dropped into a real, 
26 <laughs> people you brought into his living room. 26 yeah. people we and passed the, around. The, and the love and the care of taking care of us, treating us with tea and everyone being made to feel like family, like truly, this was Mi what casa su casa. his consciousness and his awakening. Mi his casa su casa. His heart, like the warmth of his heart and family. Anyways, so yes, one true. Of, behind him, there was sketched onto the wall. Yes. Hieroglyphs. Yes. I was there when some originally were put on the wall. <laughs> and in this moment where we were dropped in and there was every, most people went to bed, there was only a few of us left. And he was willing to go as long as... As, as long as you wanted to go. Foot of, 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 of the Himalayas, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to, I'm going to be there. So anybody yeah. would stay the night, they'd make a bed for him. Believe me, they'd I find know. a cot, they'd get your blanket and a pillow. You stay the night. I know. <laughs> and so someone said, what is that symbol? And he, they asked about a hieroglyph and its meaning and it's all, you know, all the ancient tales and stories and related wow. to it. And he was in such a Zen moment. He looks yeah. over and he goes, Oh, that one. And he, with a smile, he looks back and he goes, you know, one guy does something to another guy, and you know how it goes from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And I just broke down in stitches. He had reduced all these, if you will, great tales exactly. down to exactly. two guys having trouble with each other. Exactly. Because that's, the st boy, that's a major theme I've been getting into people. People need to go back and study mythology. That's what the great Joseph Campbell would say. He said this 40 years ago, the modern, our modern people have lost connection to our ancestors. Connections because we don't pass on the great myths. The patriarchal religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam do not pass on. They pass on their own stories of creation instead of the stories that came down. And that's why Hakim changed because of his uncle. I wanted to get to the theme of matriarchy. Because of his uncle and because of what began, he dropped his father's last name. Now on his passport, it would say, Abdel Hakim Awayan Hassan. That's his father's name, which of course we supposedly all take on, Raja. <laughs> we don't take on the mother's name. Hmm? He dropped it. And from the family, it was Awayan from then on. And everybody from his sons, daughters, everyone down carries the mother's family name, Awayan. It was probably around... The 60s or 70s, I bet it was not until he was in his 40s, but he went through a personal revelation. We're taking on the mother's name, worshiping his mother as much as he did, but she was a tyrant. We told many, many stories about her, but bless her memory, she, she was an incredibly powerful woman. And she, he's got his green eyes from his mother. That's the Aoyan met the eye tribe. Because of the green, I have the hazel green eyes. That's one of the things we connected with. His tribe comes down being the eye tribe. Aoyan means eye. They go down seven generations, they would trace it back to an actually a Bedouin sheikh named Awiyan. And it meant the eye person, the man who had the eyes. He must have had these incredible green eyes. That passed down to the family line. They could name, some of the sons could name all seven generations down, all the way down. Zeki, Mahmoud, to, 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 to him, to, 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 to Papa. So they all keep their name. They, he gave his sons all his name. They would be Yusuf Abdel Hakim Awiyan. They would be Moses, Musa, Abdel Hakim, Harun, Abdel Hakim, and they passed it down to their children, keep his memory. So he changed it somehow in his 40s, and, and he understood it, and he saw it in the ancient culture that it was a matriarchy. And, I, and the, so the first teaching we come out with when I start the basic teaching, as you know, everybody's used the word Pharaoh wrong, including myself. There were no male Pharaohs. Per ah is the high house, was the woman's house. So he was the Horus, the male symbol that she chooses. So what we see from dynastic times, which has got Egyptology so confused, is they see a gradual turning to patriarchy. As the priesthood becomes more powerful, it always was a, 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 a theocracy, never a monarchy. Understand these things, these, these kings were doing this, these kings were doing that. No, when I did this lecture in Egypt at the site of Amarna, well, not in site was, where I want to go back with you. I held up a, a little placemat that I had gotten at a restaurant in New York before I came. It showed all 45 American customs. 
So this was an international group, but I pointed specifically to the Americans. I said, how many of you in this room could name all 45? How many of you could name 20? Only the, other, the Lincoln, the Washington, the Roosevelt. Sure, they remember those guys. But how many of the other guys? They were just figureheads. They really didn't do anything significant that you should remember them. Well, you have supposedly 33 dynasties of Kemet in, in Egyptology, 33 dynasties of male kings. How many do they talk about? Just about a half a dozen that significantly may have stood out in history. The rest were figureheads, placeholders. And most of them were placeholders, especially in the early days, because the women, it was a matriarchy. Descent went from mother to daughter. The only deity they recognized in ancient Kemet, now we're talking about over 10,000 years ago, when the Sphinx pyramids were built, was the great mother. There was nobody else. There was no father, there was no son. Definitely, definitely. Only... She represents that. When they finally decided, as Hakim tells the story like no one else did, she was Newt. Newt represents the cosmic. That which is created, that which is uncreated. She is Kali, in a way, in the Hindu tradition, but she's more than that because she's Shakti, she's Shakti, Shiva, and she's uh, 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 Tara, she's all of them. I mean, but she is, brings life in, takes it out. Okay, the, the destroyer, the creator. There was only Newt. So the story is when Newt wanted to manifest in physical form on our planet, she spit. And that's what Tef Newt means. Tef means moisture, humidity, but literally spit. And that became the Sphinx. The Sphinx. So that's why, that's why that's Hakim always referred to her as Tef Newt. Tef Newt. Not Har Harakte, which becomes in dynastic times, the boy in the horizon. That's how the story of patriarchy, very simply, this is hours of lecture consoled in a few lines, is not the father, not the husband replacing the mother, but the son replacing the mother. All our patriarchal gods from Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, and even Shiva and all of them are sons of the great mother, not her consort. Later, because the patriarchy comes in and tells patriarchal mythology stories, they get elevated to the consort. But originally was only Newt. That was his basic teachings. They only understood, and even throughout dynastic times, as much as different civilizations come into Kemet, this is Kemetian history. Uh, uh, you can see first the Assyrians, the Babylonians, you have the Hebrews coming in, were born there, but you have Semites, and you have uh, uh, um, first then the Greeks and the Romans. Not until the Romans. It stays matriarchal. It still stays that the per ah is female. It's the Greeks coming in with the patriarchal mindset. See the term per a per o pharao. They attach it to the man. And they make lists with cartouches. And they think that's putting a king. So they, it is a king's list. They become kings more or less in the time period we call the New Kingdom period. Anybody that's an Egyptological file out there will understand what I'm talking about. About 1500 BCE, they, they actually become kings as we know kings now. Well, for then, they were just the male that the female had chosen, and she's the one they put up as the symbol of maleness. The Horus, the Hora. But they were not pharaohs. But that's why the great symbol of, of the greatest symbol of goddess, I just gave a whole lecture on this, was Isis. Who we call Isis? It's Izet, Izet in the ancient language. Isis. Even the people who study goddess religions and study Egyptology, I just read, read a book by a great Egyptologist she's passed on. She wrote a wonderful book about goddess mythology. Anybody wants to know, I could refer it, although she goes standard Egyptology. She doesn't see the full picture as we did. She did have never read Land of Osiris, which she should have. But she sees the importance of Isis, the most powerful goddess symbol of the ancient world. She combined all the features of all the other gods, even Newt, everybody, Hathor. She took all the features and she becomes the most powerful symbol. So. Hakim had a different definition of how you define her. She wears on her head what looks like a throne. And she became the symbol of royalty. 
So the uh, uh, the woman who would be married to the who would become the king, which they called chief for a wife, there was no word, word wife in their language. She was the pra, but she would also be identified as a daughter of Isis, because Isis is the crowns the king, Osiris, her husband, the first king. But Hakim said Izet, which they defined as meaning throne, doesn't mean throne because it's a very ancient symbol. And she becomes the very ancient goddess of Africa, who though many were before her, she incorporates all their qualities. It's a high chair. Because Hakim said in the matriarchy, the woman of the house is, this, is called Hemet. The Hemet. The term today in Arabic, any of our Egyptian brethren listening would say, means mother-in-law. Sometimes considered now a label of derision. Oh, my mother-in-law, uh, you know, that. It means woman of power. Mm. The woman of the house. So she used to sit on a chair with her feet off the ground on a footstool, and she used to be served. Quite the opposite of we think of mama today. It was totally on beck and call with this infant and the, everything this kid wants. Now, yes, you got toys, everything, food, the nipple, whatever. Your mama's there to give it to you. No, that's not the way a commission child was, born, was raised. But she was raised in mama's house. But she's to be cared for. Once the children come of age, they're to cook the meal and feed her. She would take care of them as an infant. Of course, we were helpless. But so Hakim would tell another wonderful story about ancient Kemet. Now, the children are depicted this way even in dynastic times. Every child, whether born male or female, is depicted naked with the hair in a sidelock, which a lot of the sisters wear today, the African sisters wear today, just in a sidelock, male and female. But he said, the first eight years of your life, you're under mama's rule, matriarchy, mama's house. You don't even care, you don't even know who your biological father was, because it's, again, like Zeki was to him, it's your mother's brother who becomes the father's symbol. What they call a vuncular, a vuncular system in anthropology, the matriarchy. And they say no true matriarchy, matriarchy. And a lot of anthropologists still believe no true matriarchies have ever existed. Joke. I could write a PhD thesis about the matriarchy. And I actually did to get a master's, how it was in Egypt. So eight years old, you're under mom's rule. Mama's rule. You, every, everything got to be mama. But again, whether you're male or female, no difference. There was no sex differentiation in this. At the age of eight. So you're not imprinting ideas of what men or women or boys or girls should be. None of that. None of those labels. You're letting go. Hakeem said they didn't have a word for sister, for brother, for father, for uncle. What did they have? They probably used a word that's very popular in African-American culture, cousin, cuz. Probably everybody in your tribe was your cousin, except for mama. Mama you knew, mama and child. The only, only relationship that was recognized. So at the age of eight, the child comes to mama. Now the name you're given, the first eight years what you're called is the first sound you make at birth. This is how commissions work. Yeah. The first sound a child makes, that vowel, that intone, is what it's called. Male or female makes no difference. But at the age of eight, the child comes to mama and says, Mama, I'm not going to live under your rules anymore. I'm going to go and do this. And this is what I want my name to be. And Hakim would say, She'd go like this My job is done. Go in peace. At age of eight, you were an adult. My goodness. And there was no sex gender. Like Native Americans have five sexes. They didn't have homosexuality, bisexuality. It was pansexuality. We could go on for another session for hours talking about sexual practices. Because you and I did that in, in, in 2008 in, in the hotel room in Luxor where, where 30 people were singing and dancing and getting stoned. And we were talking about Egyptian time. I was talking, telling you about Egyptian Tantra, yeah. Yes, because they found this text hidden away in the Christian stole it and hidden away in the church in Turin, Italy, which is the Shroud of Turin is there too, called the 
the erotic papyrus of Turin. What it was was a text manual for the priestesses of Hathor at Dendara, showing them having the most gymnastic, acrobatic, yogic, tantric positions you could possibly imagine. These women turning into pretzels and still having sex. And with animals, bestiality. Oh my God, people say this was just mythology. It's just symbolic. <laughs> Shows them having sex with crocodiles, with, with donkeys, whatever. Whatever they wanted. That's why people say, were the ancient commissions homosexual? Were they bisexual? No, they were pansexual. It was a sacred act. Every way it was done. No separation of sacred and profane. That's a sacred, again, we are 5,000 years of separating, separating. They didn't separate sacred and profane. It was all sacred. Even taking a shit. Everything was sacred. Sound especially. Yes. Because they did not use a spoken language like we're doing now. Now, Hakeem demonstrated to this many times, and I know it's been demonstrated to you many times. When you're using all 360 senses, it's telepathic. Sound is sacred. Sound is used to heal. Sound is used to cut and shape stone, to build pyramids. Sound is used for sacred chanting. You to raise consciousness. All this. You, you, you took me and you showed me how there's certain discarded, huge megalithic rocks and stones cut, but because they had a crack in them, they were discarded. <laughs> yeah, and you yeah. can see that they were like laser cut, right. like unbelievable. But not even laser can do that in stone. They were, no, no. sound, 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 sound with diamond tip tools. Sound alters the physics of the stone, makes it softer, and then you're still cutting it with diamond to shape it with precision, and tolerance that we can hardly duplicate today. Because of great scientists like Chris Dunn and other engineers that I brought to Egypt, we can't duplicate a lot of that today. But again, Chris Dunn went to a, 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 uh, to a man who work, works with granite, a leading person in granite in the United States. Showed him one of the boxes of the Serapium, which I have good pictures of you standing next to with me in the Serapium just recently oh my. from 2016. Yeah. He showed him, he said, okay, how would you do this? He said, okay, first of all, we'd make it four pieces. We'd both decide to get said, No, no, no. As they did it in ancient times, one single piece of granite. How would you do that? He said, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Months go by. He checks back with the guy. He said, what's your conclusion? He said, well, I'm not sure we could do it. This is in the modern day. <laughs> but the starting bid is a million dollars. To even attempt to do it with the greatest tools we have today to cut granite. So, but it sound is the key. He always said it was sound. So he demonstrated to me that there's, there's a famous picture I have. You've seen it of me and him, black and white. He's smoking shisha and, and I'm there. It looks like in deep meditation. We're in conversation. We had just had a conversation. He went and said, one day, Stephen, you'll understand what I'm saying. And he goes back to the pipe to smoke. And I hear him still talking to me. It's da, 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 da. And that was not the first time he did that telepathically exactly. communicating with me. You know, he shared something to me very penetrating. And he said that when we were sitting and diving in together, one of us was asking about the untruths in the world, mm -hmm. the lies, the distortions, the politics, the greed, the, the, the falseness in the world, and a lot of pain and suffering around that. And just immediately he says, truth for truth has a sound. And he says, because you're like this, you, anyone can say anything. You don't know what truth is, but truth has a sound. He said language, long, the tongue can lie, but the sound from where he believed, the commissions believed the seat of the soul was where we produce sound, which is what we call the larynx, pharynx, the, the trachea, and even the lungs. And that's the symbol called nephr, which means harmony, because harmony sound produces harmony. The, the, the glyph nephr really means the trachea, pharynx, larynx. And that's what he said, this never lies. Sound never lies. 
He says, you can tell what, you don't have to know what an, an animal is saying. You don't have to know the language. Listen to the tone. A bird, you know when a bird's angry, you know when a bird is happy. Singing joyfully, praising the sun when it comes up in the day. Every animal lets you know what they're thinking, what they're feeling with the sound. Basic form of communication. It's what we did before we spoke. We go, ah, ah, ah. However we communicated, ah, I like you, ah, whatever. Before touch, the senses. He even gave a progression how the senses come into order. What we have in, in religion, he said, it, what the commissions would do, and this is a term, I give credit where credit is due, his son Yusuf Awiyan, uh, it's from his father, of course, quoted the saying, the priests understood how to manipulate the ka of the people. We're talking about now people that he called the hanut, the hanuti. What was the first business? It's not prostitution, it's religion. <laughs> Spirituality became the first business these are the funerary priests, the mortuary priests. How do they begin? They come to the, we didn't call them farmers. He said they were called the food producing people and said to them, no, uh, you, don't, you don't need all the food you produce for your, just for your tribe. It was all tribal, all for your tribe. You, know, you, can, you can spare some, right? Yeah, sure. Tell you what we'll do. You ever wonder what happens to this? It's a body. Will we drop it? No, nobody ever contemplated that. They just, you know, there was no separation between life and death to them. They knew it was just a phase and you move on to another life. They said, no, what? They said, well, tell you what, we'll take care of it for you. We'll preserve it. We'll protect it. We'll do centuries of priests going handed down prayers for it, spells, so that you can come back to it. And they said, well, that sounds like a good idea. All you have to do is give half of your harvest to the temple every year. Okay, that's the first business. The first business was death because they had no word in their language for death. It was Westing going to the West. Share you know, that story when I talk, share that story when I asked him about life and death. Oh, that's one of the great stories. You know how many times I've quoted that? Again, I bless, I bless Sean, and I know Sean and, and Sean, Brenda. Sean, 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 Sean and Brenda, if they're listening, they're having a, they just posted on Facebook their wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary. But I, bl I bless Sean and I bless Carolyn for having the camera to video this. You asked them one of the most profound questions that went right to the heart of it. From where does the idea of death come from? And he says, without hesitation, from those who make benefit. And that's what we call the Hanut, because they made money off of death. That's the first, that's how religion begins. And religion continues today to make money off of death. That is the game. Or the fear why, of death. The fear of death, of course. Of course. That's the psychology of it. The fear Just the of fear. unknown after death. Well, then they bring judgment in. You will be judged on the other side. He would say to you, and they would, then at the same conversation, he said to you, not only that, he paused for a while. After he said to you, from those who make benefit, he'd say, not only that, but the promise of another life, from the womb to the tomb. That's right. From and the, the tomb, tomb to the tomb. And the tomb was not the pyramid. The tomb was the per -cow. The house of the Ka, which is our etheric body, our double, our personality, which dies when the body dies. And that's what they worshipped in the tomb. They would worship the Ka and the Chat, which is the body. They added a T in it. See, that's why we came to the title of it. The original term was Chem, with the hard CH. A lot of people say Kemet with a K. No. Again, this is where the hard CH comes in, in, in Hebrew, in Arabic, and in German, even today. Ich, ich bin. It's chem. But then when they came to patriarchy, they decided to put feminine, masculine names. That's when they started to label. And the T ending is for the land. They would say, okay, the land is feminine. Kemt. Kemt. That becomes Kemet, the way we spell it. They have one of the first Arabic terms for Egypt before it's al Misir, which it is today, was al Chem. It's where the word alchemy comes from. Alchemy is the arts and sciences of ancient chemistry. Not, right. producing, not producing gold out of lead, that was a subterfuge. And who recognized that was Carl Jukostov Jung. He knew that alchemy was a form of psychology as well as chemistry. It was more than just chemistry. It was psychology, working on yourself, perfecting yourself, which is which is the basis of every teaching. Working on self to get rid of the labels. That was his way. He did it very gently. 
not like Castaneda or others who do it harshly, who will be rough teachers. But I tell you that, that I, it's the same in the martial arts. That's why I love to talk about warrior sage. People get hung up in the warrior aspect of it, which we love, the martial arts, the physical development. But the sage is the person who has to develop the self, the spirituality, which is why we both love Bruce so much. Because Bruce got a master's degree in Chinese philosophy. I mean, he didn't fuck around. He understood it deep. And that's why he wanted to break patterns, break form, break labels. Uh, <laughs> he wanted to break form. So did Hakim, to break form, break labels. But there's different ways of doing it. In, in martial arts, you have to get your ass kicked yeah. physically. But I say a sage does that too, figuratively. And I tell people would say, oh, I wish you were as diplomatic as Hakeem because you can be rough and you, you, I have the New York City Jew in me. See, that never leaves. It's still there. And so I can be rough. I can be judgmental. I can be harsh. So Hakeem was so diplomatic. He was so gentle. I said, you never got into it with him. He kick, like, he'd kick your ass verbally. Yeah, totally. And you're doing it. He was so like, his voice dropped us into another dimension itself. Exactly. Courtesy. Um, would would it's like a red carpet underneath you just you feel like you're on a red carpet in the way exactly you know this it did i remember once you know um we were it, it was late night we had finished our day of incredible adventure and, and experiences and dives into like ancient mysteries and mm -hmm. ancient sites and energy awakenings and there was no topic that was taboo none no, no. topic that was taboo. and then what happened was we ran back a few of us who still had energy to right. come back to see Papa Hakim in the evening after everyone was settled. Right. And it was welcome, but a few had some energy left. Well, you know, I, I was like, okay, I got to be there. So here I am, I'm sitting, and then <clears throat> we're chatting and we're opening. And then a little later in the night, one of, our, one of our crew, one of the participants who had come with us, one of my students, she... Um, she had, she had had a very disturbing experience. We don't know what it was, but she was huffing and puffing and stressed and struggling and just spewing with a lot of um, this. And we were was, like, that, was that Ruth? Well, I don't want to mention the name. But, okay. Yeah, but what happened was the individual came up and, and I was like, we were like, are you okay? We were just trying to get a breath in. And he looks at her and she had some piss and vinegar in her. And he just goes, he goes, okay, honey. You win. Oh, oh, no. I know who it was. I know the whole story. I know who it was. I know the whole story. It was about a financial deal that went down in the shop. And it was about money. And it was about this and that. And she went on and on about it. And Hakeem said, it's none of my fucking business. Because he was not involved in the business in the shop downstairs. Yeah. He you said, know, he said, so he said, you win. She was saying, it counted this way. It counted that way. And he took her hand and said, you're right. You win. It's over. Forget about it. Yeah, it was just, it, it was the warmth that he, that, that was the disarming. Right. It was the acceptance of her state. That's and the grandfather. That's the grandfather. He was, that was what it was. It was like a beautiful act of grandfatherly love. Absolutely. You win. You win. Yes. Okay. And that part that needed to be expressed to, to, to gain ground back was mm. fulfilled. Beautiful. No, no, they, he, again, he had the master ability to look through you. He'd look into your eyes, into your insides, and know exactly what level you were at. So somebody would answer your question, and if you don't notice, sometimes he'd go, ah, mm. and he'd look back, how am I going to answer this question? Okay, and he'd level it, answer the question on their level. Like somebody asked at a UFO conference, was Osiris a real person or a myth? And he looked at the audience, he looked at the person and said, a myth. But we know all the myths are based on real events in space and time. So there, there was a ancient, perhaps extraterrestrial, whatever, king in Africa who was modeled, became the model for this nether that meant wholeness, completeness, wisdom. The wizard, the name wizard, this comes from the English words wisdom and wizard. So that was what the netter represented, but how to answer them, it's a myth. Go read what the Egyptologists say. I'd love you to share 
bringing all this ancient Egyptian wisdom to this moment, right? It is, again, cycles, because we've gone through this before. Where are we at now? We've done this before. Okay, people want to think this virus is unique because we don't have immune system for it. It's just a mutant of a, of a whole system of coronaviruses, which we know about, which is related to the flu, blah, blah, blah. But we've gone through these things before. The back blue, the bubonic plague called the Black Death in the 14th century wiped out three quarters, 75% of the population of Europe. But you see, the point here is the lessons. If you do not learn the lessons of history, you are doomed to repeat them. So even a hundred years ago, we don't have to go back. There was this flu, which they raciously called the Spanish flu, like they call this the Chinese flu. It's neither one of those. It originated from bats, from animals, from bad habits. And uh, even in Spain in 1918, it didn't originally come from Spain. They think it came from Sub-Saharan Africa, made it come from the Middle East, whatever. 1918 was a pandemic. In the spring, two to four million people died of this flu worldwide. But what was going on at that time? We had a war, the Great War. Yes. And it ended in September. Imagine they still fought a war during the pandemic. That blows my mind. But they did. And it ended in September. Everybody thought, well, and these things go in cycles, my brother, in cycles. And I'll talk about what is a virus even so people can understand. So it, it, it meditated for a while. It seemed to go down. The numbers went down. Everybody gathered to celebrate the end of the war, gathered in huge groups, celebrated, celebrated. In the fall, when the second wave came, it's estimated 20 to 40 million people died worldwide. There will be a second wave. It's how we deal with it. <laughs> so what is a virus? People talk about killing the virus. Well, you really don't kill a virus. The virus is the most amazing thing there is because it's the basic building block. You can't say it's alive and you can't say you kill it. It's just a piece of protein that has a fat membrane around it, but it has the ability, obviously, to have consciousness. So what does it do? It finds a host to invade and it replicates itself. It invades the nucleus of that host and it takes over. That's how cancer happens, from a virus taking over the nucleus of the body. This one invades the respiratory tract. Seems to have a prevalence for there. And if it gets deep into the lungs, and you have other conditions like asthma, like heart condition, like cancer, it can be deadly. And that's what it's doing. And so, but we've been through this before. One of the major things we talk about is the great cataclysm that happened in ancient Kemet around 12,000 years ago. Barbara Han Clow, who was the one who brought me to Hakim's house in the first place in 1992, mentions him many times in her books as her teacher. She wrote a book called Catastrophobia, based, based on the work of Vladimir Velikovsky, a great Freudian psychologist, saying that some event happened, a cataclysmic event which ended the great civilizations at that time and changed the climate, changed the whole environment. And she was right. And she said she reprinted the book in 2010, and I recommend it highly for people to read, called the Awakening the Planetary Mind. And she said that we, we will come with this life in our genetic DNA the memories of this traumatic event. That's why humans act collectively when there's a cataclysmic event. What is the theme mostly in this age of honor? I, me, mine. Separation. Hidden, no. But then you had the burst of the 60s, the Aquarian age, which we looked at us, we, we. Well, when a cataclysm happens, and we see it all around the world, Everybody reacts. Oh, wow, it's terrible. We can help. Can we send doctors? Can we send aid? Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do that? And they share information, which I'm not going to get political, but why the U.S. has suffered as it has, because it didn't share the information. Other countries did. Italy, Spain, France, especially from China. When China first released information, they didn't at first. They played the Amman game and kept the information to themselves. That's why they let the, the, the virus spread as bad as it did. It goes to political. What is politics? Hakim would talk about it all the time. He was the master linguist. You talk about languages. Polistika comes from the Greek word, means city talk. City talk means there was another talk in the country. Politics happens in the city. When they form city states, and then they had to like representatives of the people. People couldn't speak for themselves. So meaning it's not real talk. 
people is tikkun politics. But it is what it is. It is what rules the world in this age of us and them, us and them. So what these events do is they recognize the one of the major teachings Hakim gave us. That the commissions did not differentiate white, black, red, brown. There was no concept of race. There was no concept of nationality. There was no concept of gender, as we said. When that child at eight years old decided what it wanted to be, it also decided what gender it would follow, no matter what its plumbing was. No matter if it had a penis or a vagina. It followed a path that it wanted. Could women's work, men's work, no such thing. So when we, when we differentiated that way, is where we lost the way that us and them. That's why a lot of the original creation myths, even in the, in the Kabbalah, talk about the first being that the, the Hebrew God created was male and female stuck together as one being called Adam Kadman. And then God then sliced them in two. But the later rabbis didn't like that story. So it had to be with the rib, and he was first. Which doesn't mean, the word doesn't even mean rib in the ancient language. And the snake doesn't mean snake. It means the consciousness, the ego. What tempts supposedly the woman in the garden is ego. You can be as God if you eat of the fruit of knowledge. But the commissions had already eaten of the fruit of knowledge. They didn't need that stuff. Great mother always forgets. The most powerful force Hakim taught us that the ancient sword that's represented by Sechmet, which is a, which is a variation of Chemet. She means the power. The power. The unconditional love of one. See, so that's why if we were true, you would be Satya and Rickards. Yes. And I'd be Stephen Title, which was my mother's name. But we'd have to go back to their mother's name. The mother's name that comes back from the mothers, from the mothers, from the mothers, from the mothers. Ancient people used to be able to do that. Hakim would blow my mind. We would sit together in the village, in the cafe across the village, after the tour was over, was some of my favorite times. Sharing with him, I, Papa, I saw this at this site. Oh, Stephen, you know what that means? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. Papa, I saw this at that site. Oh, that means so and so and so. We would just go over the whole tour and he would just continue to share with him. So, but people that would come by, tradition, of course, is to call someone from their father's name, their father's family. Hakim would spot somebody and call them from their mother's name, their mother's family. And they would go, Oh, thank you, boy. And that's why he was so venerated. He was so respected. He was the mayor of the village. The, 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 his cousin, whose perfume shop we would go to next door, Ali, he uses the title El Omda. That means the head man. It's like the village man or the mayor. You know, he would, so one time I'm sitting with Ali and he'd be just going, you know, the truth is Hakim is really El Omda. And I know that because before him, Zeki had been El Omda. And Zeki's father, Hakim's grandfather, whose name Mahmoud, who a lot of it comes down from, he was El Omda. So it was a tradition from Hakim's family. The males were, again, it's, not, it's Islam, the head man of the village. But it was the women who kept the secrets, only in secret. And it's time we're seeing the rise of the feminine in a very powerful and beautiful way. Well, that's it. That's the understanding. Everything has to balance out. It goes this way. That was the women's movement in the 70s. It, you know, it's coming back now. It had to swing in direction. The same with African-Americans in the U.S. from from the, the dent of slavery, had to fight the 50s and 60s, and it had to swing one way. You know, it's swinging back. It'll come to a point where there's no who's head, who's, you know. Again, people don't understand matriarchy. That's why we have to try to bang them over the head. They think, oh, that means a woman is on top and the male is inferior. No. No male ever thought himself inferior. In these days, we had roles, we had plays. You could be a warrior. You could be a priest. You could be an engineer. You could be a martial artist. I have glyphs that somehow I have to show you. It is a tomb in Saqqara. I've sent you, I think, some of the images. I can send them again. At, at, and there was one at, at, at this site called, uh, it'll come to me, where it looked like they were doing wrestling. People would say, oh, let's see. That's doing right. wrestling. No, they were doing martial arts. You can That's see right. it. You can see. <laughs> now, my friend, we need to wrap up now. So I just want to, like, I'm like... Okay, so the message. Let's no, give them the no. message. The message is we've been through this before. The idea is what I'm seeing, the powerful message is 
together, together. People are doing what we're doing. You're doing it by doing video conferences, getting another teacher here, a teacher here, and sharing. People are on Zoom now like crazy and teaching school because there won't be, they're not going to be in class schoolroom probably in U.S., maybe to the end of December, to the end of the year, certainly not through June. They're not going back to classes. So all classes are now in line. It's more getting to great musicians are doing concerts solo online. Great philosophers are doing exactly what we're doing. So this is the deal. It's these events that bring us together. Hakim taught the idea of the sesh. There were 42 tribes that made of Kemet, 42 basic tribes, but they all thought of themselves as the sesh, the people. Nobody was stronger. There was no hierarchy. A lot of what's wrongly taught in academia and anthropology and some of the traditions is we've always had hierarchical understanding. There's God and there's priests and there's a people. No, hierarchy comes through patriarchy. There was no hierarchy in, in ancient Kemet. Hard for us to understand because we live in labels. We live in separation. We live in hierarchy. But everybody was, that's why I said eight years old, you decided what you were going to be. And you went on and you did it. And everybody enthused, gave you enthusiasm. Nobody blocked you. Nobody tells you, you can't do that because you're so-and-so. Bullshit never existed. Never. A unity. And now this is the cycle to come back. Would you please end with us with Hakim used to get yes. us to be in a circle, whole yes. hands. Yes, the commission prayer. Yes, please. Okay. We so take one watching. Um, Let's hold hands in the heart, wherever we are in the world. Right on, right, because this is a prayer of unity. And we'll explain what it means when it's over. Uh, uh, the key phrase that will come at the end. But it is three breaths taken through the nose and through the mouth. Then there are three expressions that I repeat in English, and everybody repeats after. So, first breath. The light surrounds me. The light surrounds me. The light comes through me. The light comes through me. I am the light. I am the light. It's good. It's done. So be it. So mode it be. Yakini, yakini. Yakini, yakini. Now, for those that don't know, yakini, yakini, Hakim said he came up with it himself, but it's based on a very ancient expression. It has to deal with protection and knowledge and power. Okay, it said, and he would say in one breathe, as he would say in English, one breath. Sounds like the same word, but you say it together, yakini, yakini. And the English translation he and I came up with, I am protected by the power of my positive. What is the positive? You know what you know. What is true wisdom? And this is what I've been doing a lot lately, doing life journey at my age. It's experience. It's not what's in a book. It's not what some guru tells you. It's not what any master tells you. It's what you've experienced in your life. And that truth protects you. So this was a mantra, he said, could be used in any situation when you feel under stress, under duress, attacked, either physically or mentally, psychically, whatever. Yakini, yakini. Let's I'm do it one more time. Yakini, yakini. I'm protected by the power of my positive. How I. Oh, oh my love, everyone. Again, brother. And to everyone out there, I love you all. Yeah.